applause, Harley Davidson, the FX GTS Sport Live. All right, guys, I want to welcome everybody out to Laidlaw's Harley Davidson season number two, kicking off a new season here with my co-host Keith Hurt. Yeah, man. Excited about it. We took a little break. So, uh, yeah, we're back. Everyone's out of their caves and we're getting back going again. So, season two. Things got busy. Things got really busy. Yeah, they did. You got a ton of big projects going on in the shop right now. We do, so. yeah, including some uh, really cool performance bagger projects, which we're going to talk about a lot today. Um, with these guys and yeah it's an exciting time things are getting going again and uh yeah, we're really busy yeah very cool so we have some pretty awesome guests on the show here today we got rob bidos and alex fox and today we're going to be talking mostly about the whole performance bagger movement and how that's being integrated into racing right now and it's really popular and these guys are obviously right in the thick of it so First off, Rob, welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. Hey, guys. Thanks a lot. I'm really uh, pleased to be here. Robbie Lane from Alloy Art told me I had to stop by and be here, so <laughs> I know I'm going to have a good time if he recommended it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, we had those guys on a little while ago. Always good guys. We love the Alloy Art guys. Um, and Alex, appreciate you being here, man. Yeah, thanks for having me. Obviously a big name in uh, the, the bagger racing world, and we had their, their bike on our stage for those of you who were able to come down and check out Alex Fox's bike, and they, he ran it. Uh, on the Laguna Seca race, and he's going to be running it in the in the future on a bunch of other bagger racing league races as well. But um, one of the more good looking bikes, uh, definitely one of the more um, well built bikes that we've seen uh, of of the group. Yeah, these things are crazy, man. I mean, we've had a few of them in the shop. We had the mullet, we had Alex's bike, we had the Saddleman bike. I mean, all of them have their own little spin, their own little details. But like Alex's bike and the Saddleman bike too is really finished, like the. The fit and finish on them are, like, really nice, yeah. and everything's real detailed and clean, and, yeah, it's really cool, and, yeah, it's, they're, they're really neat neat machines. If you get close to seeing one, they're, they're really neat. Yeah, they're pretty dang nice. So, for those of you who don't know Rob, I mean, he's pretty much the, the voice of motocross now for over 20 years. The guy is the MC of the Moto Fight Night. Uh, he's emceed a bunch of different power sports industry races over the years, Monster Energy Cup. Um, he's a big spokesperson for drag specialties as well, which – was another one of the, the big advocates for the start getting the whole bagger racing going really um and he's also one of the the biggest uh, proponents or originators of getting the entire bagger racing thing going in the first place you want to talk about that for a second rob sure i guess uh you know you have to start somewhere so um for me um i'd always been you know a, a big harley davidson fan we were talking just a bit off the i had 81 sturgis and then a bunch of fxrs and on and on and on and every time along the way, just to make sure that you were the, the top of the food chain, you had to win a bike show. Mm -hmm. You'd go to Sturgis, you'd go to Daytona, you'd enter in a big bike show, and you'd win the bike show. And that would kind of set the pecking order for a whole year. And that was kind of how you determined where the, you know, where the real supremacy lied. A couple of years ago, I'm noticing, man, these bikes are getting road race wheels, and they're made out of carbon fiber, so they're not painted anymore. Yeah. They don't have a bunch of intricacies and they're riding them so hard that they're scraping things you know if you would have scraped a traditional bike show bike a couple years you would have repainted the whole thing you yeah. couldn't show up with scars on the side of your bags and things <laughs> yeah. and now all of a sudden those are badges of honor because you're getting it down you know you're laying it over so um i'm looking at it, i go man these things are never going to represent themselves very well in a traditional bike show but i think the way they're looking and the way these people are riding them and the the ergonomics of the bike and everything, I, th I think they could go to a road race track and show what the aftermarket has created. And I was fortunate enough to uh, be walking around with Brock Glover. I don't know if any of you guys know him. He's a Hall of Famer and a, a six-time motocross uh, champion. And we were in uh, Beaver Falls, Pennsylvania <laughs> at uh, Pittsburgh International Raceway, and they were having road race there. And uh, Wayne Rainey, who's a Hall of Famer, he's a magnificent guy, uh, part of the Moto America crew, um, he was cruising around on, on uh, one of those little, little little buggies he has and uh, knows Brock, obviously, incredibly well, so we're stopped. And where we stopped was the parking lot. And he looked around and goes, man, do you see how many Harleys are here? And I'm like, yeah, there's tons of them. I said, yeah. a lot of the Harley dealers around here are big MotoGP guys, and when they heard that a race was coming, they, they come to check it out. I said, but you ought to see what these guys are doing with these things. Well, after a really quick conversation, and I got to thank Brock Glover for this because I think that ended the credibility to it where he, where he listened. Fine, let's do it. And, and I think the whole concept was, well, we got a little time in the program. Let's try to fill it in and give these guys something to watch. 
Well, by the time we were able to get it done, people were watching and were like kind of blown away by yeah. just how incredible they worked, what it looked like in person on the track, the way they were backing them into the, just like everything. And now all of a sudden here we are where people are feverishly waiting for what we're going to do with the Bagger Racing League in Salt Lake City. Yeah. So they, they weren't just all a show, you know, it's, it's easy to put the parts on and make it look real pretty, but they were actually performing to a level of what they looked like, basically. Well, you know, uh, like I said, the bike show scene, you know, the aftermarket guys, the fabricators, the, uh, the people that really bring those bikes to life, you know, this was like a whole blank canvas for them. And they're really still learning, you know, what is the proper rake on the front ends to get the most ground clearance out of the bike? Where can you go so that the primary doesn't drag? It's, they're, they're looking at things in a completely different light right now. How do yeah. we get the most horsepower out? But as we talked with qualifying, with practice, this thing has to last. You could get 180, 190 horsepower, but it's probably not going to be what's going to get you to the finish line. Yeah. We think it's about a buck 40 is the yeah. real sweet spot. Yeah, the best description I heard of that was a, it was actually an interview that Rob did. And I can't remember who the racer was, but it was one of the riders from the first uh, race. And he said, yeah, we we scheduled this bike show and a race broke out. <laughs> that's about <laughs> it. <too. Yeah. laughs> I was like, dang, that's pretty yeah. funny. World's fastest bike show. Yeah, yeah. I like that. So, Alex, obviously you're owner-operator of uh, Sly Fox Performance. You guys do a lot of the parts that are built specifically for these performance baggers. Uh, obviously, you have kind of a lineage of racers in your family, your dad being uh, the famous IndyCar racer, Stan Fox. He's, you know, was the last racer to win Ascot. Um, talk a little bit about how that's impacted your life and talk a little bit about your business and, and the parts and, and kind of the evolution of this, this, I don't know if I want to call it a trend, but this, this movement going on with the performance baggers. Okay, so I grew up in the industry, my dad being a race car driver, that kind of emulates my whole brand and what we do and our focus. Um, yeah, my, my dad uh, won the last, ra last race at Ascot. Uh, he was an open-wheel midget racer, sprint car, and then he made ties in Indy 500 through that. Um, his last year at Indy was in 95. Unfortunately, there was a bad wreck, and it kind of put his career to a halt. But um, he stuck around and continued to be around the scene for a while and brought me around and really introduced me to all these race guys. And my uncle, his brother, he's uh, big in the industry. He's a parts distributor and engineer, so... You know, between him and my dad, I've really gotten the taste of the whole race vibe and, yeah. and the motorcycle industry, and that's kind of how the brand formed. You know, I've been around. I worked for Saddleman. I've worked for Drag Specialties. I've worked for Thor Motocross. Uh, I worked for Slippery Wetsuits. I don't know if you heard of yeah. them, but they yeah, have, yeah. you know, in the jet ski world. So I've gotten a little taste here and there, and, you know, through networking and learning a lot, I built my own brand, and... You know, the timing was right on for this performance bagger scene that's kind of emerged. And then yeah. When did you launch your brand? Uh, three years ago now. Okay. Yeah. Um, back in 2018, into 2018. And then the official launch was Sturgis 2019 under the drag truck. Um, and, and it's been killing it since. It's been doing good. Um, what, what are some of your biggest parts right now that you're um, the best with? That, like maybe the most proud of? My front carbon fender. Um Nice. It's, it's I can't keep it in stock. You know, it's been doing really yeah. well. It's a little under a pound. You know, I don't know what the stock one weighs, but in comparison, you shed probably eight to ten pounds. Yeah, there. it's a lot. Uh, <laughs> it's a little under a pound. <laughs> yeah, it's a little. Under a actual pound. fender so, weighs yeah less than dang. a pound. So that's impressive. That's the number one seller. You know, I'm proud of that piece, and we keep growing the line. We just came out with an exhaust. I got a seat through Saddleman, uh, handlebar risers. And, you know, we're going to continue to grow. It's just the industry is so crazy right now. I don't have time to focus on development. I'm focusing on just getting parts out the door into my customers. But, yeah. Um, now, now, um, now, are you racing or you have a racer for your bike? Or how does that work? I have a professional riding okay. car bike. Yeah. Corey right West. He ran the first race and he'll be running the BRL as well. Very nice. So, Very That's cool. a common theme for a lot of the teams. They have a professional rider right. that rides their bike. and they. Well, one of the things that we did... Um, we have the bagger GP class, which is our premier, and yeah. you need an expert license. And when we did this the first time, that was the, the protocol. Oh, yeah. So we kept that as our premier class. But all the other classes, and, and I'm sure we'll get into more of that, but we have a hooligan class. We have a pro stock bagger class. And then the class that I'm the most excited to see myself is the big twin class. Right. Never been done. Another, yeah. another one that's never been yeah. done. So FXR's Dyna Softails and the brand new Indian Chief. The kind of Dyna twin shock thing that right. the Indian just came out with. Yeah. Um, 
you have to have a novice license, meaning you have to have attended a race school, done a couple track days. And so this is the grassroots side of it. Yeah. We're going to have the, 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 the Ben Bostroms and the Corey West. And uh, we have a real interesting thing. Not only do we have Corey West, but uh, we have Patricia Fernandez, his girlfriend, who's going to be riding one of the Indian challengers as well. Oh, okay. And from what I hear, oh, the lap times were Close. You didn't know who was who. Oh, you know, wow. it's going to be good. So. That's awesome. Yeah. Man, Indian that's going to be pecking order around the house, friend. huh? Yeah, that's, that's awesome. <laughs> Seriously. Make me yeah. a sandwich. I beat you. <laughs> yeah, whoever <laughs> yeah, loses got to make a sandwich for yeah. next week. And that's probably going to be Patricia talking to Corey. <laughs> uh, that's awesome. Well, let's, yeah, let's back up a little bit and uh, let's make that distinction of kind of the different steps that have taken and transpired over the past year and a half. So, uh, obviously, I started catching wind of this whole, this bagger racing uh well, they were calling King of the Baggers, right, initially? Yeah. Yep. And um, I first heard about it from Ted, who's our drag specialties rep. Mm -hmm. And he was talking about these different builders from these different aftermarket companies that were coming in. Um, you know, you got at your Alloy Art. You've got, uh, obviously, Sly Fox, Saddleman, um, Fueling, Krause. Speed, um, Merchant. Fueling, Speed, Merchant. Speed Merchant. Yeah, yeah thanks, guys. Bassani was in on it. Bassani, uh, yep. Performance Machine was obviously there. Vance and Hines was a big part of it. Roland Sands came yep. out. Yeah. Indian was there. Indian was there. And yep. you know, s and Indian was the first one to sign up for this. So we're going to. Oh, yeah. Okay. They've had a pretty good run of luck. We're going to see yeah. if somebody yeah. can't. Uh, Kind of throwing them. Yeah, yeah we'll see. Like, hey, had, they bring a solid game. You it know had that. Been sure. like late to nineteen, maybe early two thousand twenty, when when uh, Ted was coming around originally, kind of like pumping everyone late up. Late nineteen. And, yeah, it was like late nineteen, right? Well, because the race actually happened. The Laguna Seca race happened when uh, October. Is that October? 20, yeah, and uh, it was scheduled yeah. for July. Right. Um, you know, the regular schedule would come out. What was kind of ironic was, of oh, twenty, the yeah. drag yeah. specialties ride, and every year, this is all pre-COVID stuff. So right. we, every year for, I don't know, 10 or 12 years, they have the dealers, they pick an exotic location in America that's great for riding V-twins for scenery and, and uh, the ambiance and the vibe, and we go there and party. So we're there, and again, pretty much the laundry list of people you just said. I said, hey, would you guys build a bike for this? And they, you know, some of them like Alex and, and Robbie and, and yeah. Luke jumped on, but there were definitely some that went, what you know and i'm like <laughs> you want to go where with this and i'm like laguna sake and i'm like you're you know they Crazy. just couldn't see it now it was funny some of the people that pushed back the hardest as we got closer were like hey maybe we made a mistake yeah. on this and we went in you know we're so now, yeah. you know we were able to add some uh some to the lineup right in the the critical time they had time to get their bikes done obviously yeah. but at first it you know you either hear it and go okay or you're just blown away by you have no yeah. idea. Yeah. So, so how did this come about? So you were going around to these different people and teams. And so teams we're on the drag pitching, ride. Pitching, pitching the and we're, you know, in the most important place you could be to do anything, sitting in a bar, <laughs> <laughs> had a napkin out, you know, and a pen. What if we did, the, you know, and we had a, a captive little group. Alex was sitting there. And like I said, Robbie yeah. Lane and Luke and Daryl Bassani. And they're like, yeah, Dave Eckert and Chris Eckert from Saddleman were there. And it was kind of almost like a little... Guys, want to do this? Yeah, ready, break, and and we did, and then we were able to add some more people to it, and yeah. lo and behold, it it happened and showed everybody what's possible. That's how you get things done, man. Yeah, yeah. around the, around the table at the bar and a napkin. That's, That's what you need sometimes. Yeah, you gotta no, have a napkin oh, though. Man. Without a napkin, yeah. nothing happens. Nothing happens. <laughs> well, so very cool. So you pitch all these people. Some of them were on board. Some people were a little bit more hesitant to maybe decline at first, but circled back and came back. So the stage is set. We're going to Laguna Seca. Um, it's, it's put on under the umbrella of Moto America. It happens. What, what's happening as you guys are preparing to go to the race? Um, and you guys are setting up shop on the racetrack. Like what, what was the perception? Like, how are you guys accepted out there? Well, okay. So you got to remember we're scheduled to go in July and Alex probably knows we probably really had this thing locked down around October, November, right? Yeah, we locked it down late. Um, the perception, this was a new breed to Moto America. Yeah. So they didn't want it to look like a swap meet. Right. That's yeah. what they were worried about. They thought we're going to come out there, oil the track, parts are going to be flying off these bikes. Yeah. You know, first practice, everyone was kind of watching, trying to see what happened. Then they saw what these bikes were really doing. Next thing you know, it was the most popular event yeah. of, of the whole weekend. You know, so I think we really opened their eyes. And, man, how many views did the thing get? Uh, Millions, millions from what yeah, I hear. Millions, now, millions the, of views, so. the crazy thing, so we hadn't been on the track yet, and as I walk up, because it's our time, yeah. you know, so 
there's probably a two minute of downtime between the last bike pulling off and as they're pulling them on, there's a couple of race officials standing there. And, you know, they're, they're, they're being funny yeah. to each other. You know, what do you think these things are going to turn? 205s. I was like, the water truck do a 205. You know what I mean? It was like, and it was, you know, we're standing there. Yeah. And I don't know what they're going to turn. Yeah. And I, so I, I go, what's a fast time? And you're like a 123, a 126, somewhere around there. I'm like, okay. Right. So 123 to two, and you know, because this is what they tell me. So I'm thinking maybe that's going to be the first bike comes through 141. The next time it comes through 138, they're like, oh, those are a lot faster than we thought. I'm yeah. like, yeah, it's surprising. And yeah. the sound, obviously, as they're whoa, 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 you know, coming yeah. by with the V twin. I mean, it just the pat. They're down there and they're like, "Wait, we got to go see what this is because it just sounds <laughs> yeah. too violent no to not watch." Sound. You know, and, yeah. And yeah. man, it it that's what really I think the sound. And then as you see them squirreling, coming to back them into the corner and getting it's, in and out. Yeah, it's wild when you watch it, like the, the how big the bikes are, and you don't really get a sense of it until you like until you see them next to the bikes that they they race in the normal classes. They're so much larger. And, like, the way these guys ride them, is, it's wild. And you see them going, like, into corners together, like, two and three at a time. And you're like, what? There's no room at all. You can't. There's yeah. nowhere to go. But they somehow find a way to get around each other. It's, like, it is amazing, like, fun racing to watch. And Robbie told the same kind of story when we had him on the podcast. He was like, dude, we got there. And it was kind of like we were, like, the black sheep at first. And then by the Sunday, everyone's on the pit wall watching us come by, you know. And, it, like, everybody was, like, so stoked. And they were so surprised at how – great the bikes did and how fast they were and how great everybody, how cool everyone was and stuff. Yeah. And, and yeah. what, you know, probably helps a lot is that, uh, you know, you're, you're pitting them against other very similar bikes. So any type of, uh, advantage, you know, that, yeah. you know, the, the Ninja or the R1 type bike has, it's, they have to share the same kind of <laughs> things that limit what they can do on yeah. them. So it, it really becomes a, a great race yeah. format for them to watch. That's cool. Well, I thought like there's some creativity too on like what people, how the people build their bikes. Like one guy may have this type of primary, another guy may not have that, but there's that creative liberty. Whereas on the sport bike world, everybody's kind of at the same place. And so the build of the bike isn't so much, you know, a part of the aspect of competition anymore. It's pretty much just the racer and, you know, the bike. But in the bag of racing world, it's kind of like, okay, I'm going to try this part. I'm going to try this front end. I'm going to try this rake angle. And so the creativity of your bike build really plays a direct aspect in who wins the race. Yeah. All in the, those early stages, the learning stages, right. you know, it might get there, you know, but as of right yeah. now, you know, open primary is gaining more clearance over a standard primary, and we're learning yeah. these little these little tidbits, but yeah, right now is the fun stage. I'm having fun, the whole camaraderie of the pits, everyone's helping each other out because we all want to make this happen. We want it to be successful. Well, so. that's the fun part of racing, you know. It's like yeah. everyone's helping each other and trying to keep everyone running, and the competition part of it is there. But it's like, hey, man, if I can help that guy get his bike on the track so I can actually race him and so we can see who's better, that's cool, man. That's that's like, and that's where it's at right now, innovation and learning how to make the bikes faster and teaching each other and not being so secretive and trying to like help each other out. That's, that's a cool vibe. That's really cool. No, it, it's, it's fantastic right now. It's yeah. really some of the most fun I've had, you know, in the, in the Harley industry. And, and I've had, obviously you go to yeah. Sturgis Daytona, it's a good time. The camaraderie, you know, hang out with Alex or Robbie, or like we said, yeah. everybody, you have a good time. But <laughs> when there's something that everybody is so jazzed about, you yeah. know, you talk to somebody every day, what have you been doing? Nothing. What do you doing? I built a whole brand new set of rear sets today. You know, you're like, yeah. okay, okay. So <laughs> yeah. there's stuff happening. It's just, it's so contagious. Yeah. That's super cool. Yeah, so um, let's talk a little bit. About, okay, we had the Laguna Seca race. That mm -hmm. went well. It got a ton of popularity, you know, to Alex's point. Tons of social media views. I remember watching it. I was at this uh, off-road motorcycle training course with my dad, and we were watching it in our motorhome. And I was seeing, like, the hundreds of thousands of views click up. I was like, how does this compare to – because I, I typically don't follow Moto America races, really. Um, and so I was like, how does this compare? And, you know, the, the bagger racing stuff, King of the Baggers racing stuff was like – uh, exponentially more than yeah. the other races um and people are like okay well maybe it's because it's new you know and but i think that you guys the bagger world has really tapped into this uh unfulfilled racing type where there's so many different harley riders out there like this new audience that is now hey we have reason to watch racing again yeah you, you know when i um again first really started fooling around with bikes you took whatever it didn't matter if it was an fxr or a soft you slammed the thing on the ground there was nothing else you could do with yeah. it it was 
pigeonholed as I'm going to drive it yeah. into parking lots and put it on its kickstand, walk away, and people are going to ogle it. Yeah. And, you know, now that you have these people that want to ride so hard, and it's one of the safest things you could do. Everyone's going the same direction. There's a personnel right there. There's not potholes. There's not, yeah. you know, there's... If you want to really see what you're capable of on a bike, this is the spot to do it. Just yesterday, now I'm from Northeast Ohio, and I still live there, so um, not exactly the hotbed for performance market. Mm -hmm. On a Monday, very similar to what we did at Chuck Walla out here, a group of dealers back in Northeast Ohio rented Nelson Ledges Road Race Course. And they had over 50 guys show up. This wow. is Northeast Ohio. Dang. Wow. And just, and, and the talk and the camaraderie and the vibe, talking to my friends back home is, yeah. when are we doing this again? I'm like, I don't know when you guys put it together. <laughs> yeah. When are you doing it again? So they think in about a month or so, they're because they're friends now all, they you know, it's hard to explain to somebody what a track day is if you haven't been haven't to been, one. Yeah. Now they've come out and watched, they all want to do it. So yeah. I, I really think that, you know, you have the 9 million odd plus Harley riders that have never been invited to race their bike, drag race. Yeah. But not in an environment like this. No. So now that there's a chance, all we want is 1%. Give us the 900 riders. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Didn't the trike make it on the track? We, we had a trike. Yeah. <laughs> oh, <I> mean, really? <laughs> yeah. A guy on a free, free wheeler, is that what it's called? Yeah. Shop yeah. owner, my man Bruce Miner out there, Youngstown Harley Davidson, has free wheeler out on a road wow. race. So we've had that now happen. Dang. And there's still been more of those than an FXR Dyna Softail race. So, that's you know, crazy. That's, that's the wild. funny thing about that's coming out of class. <laughs> So, um, so tell us a little bit about, so obviously you guys now represent the Bagger Racing, you're involved with the Bagger Racing like League. What transpired after the whole Moto America to get us now into the Bagger Racing League, and what exactly is it? And let's talk a little bit about that. Sure, thank you. Um, you know, we had a race where all the class, and obviously we were the support slash novelty class at the end of a day on Saturday, the first time. So everything leading up to us was your super traditional road race, the style of bike, the the technology was through the roof. The weight were down into the, you know, 300-pound range. Yeah. Just, you know, sharp scalpels, basically. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the way it's always been. And so if you're a fan, you're used to it. You're, you know, you, you get used to it. Well, we're thinking, man, it'd be hard for us because we have so many different varieties of V-twins that didn't get to race. The Sportster guys, you know, the yeah. again, the big twin guys and the guys that had the baggers that want to do it, but... They haven't had decades of road racing experience, so they would have to catch up. So we thought, well, rather than try to infiltrate something that, you know, isn't traditionally our, our forte, let's just make it so we have one just for our client base, our community. And that's yeah. what we've come up with. So awesome. we don't have a support class for, I mean, they're, they're, they have a, a world-class series, so they don't need a support class for the metric bike, so to speak. Yeah. But we need one just for us so that we're featured and the best thing is the the uh, sponsors the folks that are going to come vendor um the arlen ness custom bike show it's all just for a v-twin community you don't have to share it with everybody else and we don't have to make them come and you know assimilate to what we like sure totally. you know, so it's going to be something just for what people that like sturges people that like rallies people that like parties it's going to be for them yeah. yeah, and or then the you're gonna twin. walk to the track and go, "What? Yeah, what is this? Yeah, yeah." You know, I've never had someone really describe it like like you just did, and that makes a lot of sense. I mean, obviously, there's kind of two different uh, tastes of, of people. Some people prefer the high end sport bike, to use your words, like the sharpened scalpel, the laser, you know, super high technology. And there's the guys that like the V twin world. So yeah, it makes sense to have it all just in one thing. And um, yeah, I just have V twins out there on the track. So. Yeah, I mean, every time that you hear a sound coming from the track, you're going to be like, wait, I probably owned one of those at one point in my life. Let's go see it, you know? Yeah, and yeah. and it's, it's so funny. The, the, the funniest thing for me coming home, and this was just like how, how, it, how it portrayed for me. Um, my wife and I are flying home from uh, Monterey. And just kind of out of nowhere, she goes to me, she goes, so Dave was right. Dave's a friend of mine back home. I'm like, you know, what are you talking about? She goes, I've heard you guys argue 30 times or more that a road glide's better than a street glide. Uh -huh. But a street glide got second and a road glide got fourth. So that means, I'm like, you picked that up? She goes, yeah, one has one headlight and one has two, right? I'm like, <laughs> yeah. And I mean, my wife doesn't follow racing. like uh, she, But yeah. that's what she picked up from that was that a street glide beat a road glide. So she oh, thought that go. was... You know, That's and I mean, cool. it's that kind of thing when you're standing there, you're like, yeah, I, I know what that is. I have one of those, yeah. you know, yeah. so 
that means my bike is better. So it's just funny how people are perceiving it. They're identifying with it because yeah. they own the bikes. Sure. You know? That's a huge part. Yeah, that's, and that's something I think we talked a little bit about with Alloy Art, too, is there's so many people that own Harleys, and when they go to these races, they can identify with the bikes that are being raced out there and, like, yeah, I own that bike. It's just one or whatever. So well, early on, they're like, well, can we take the bags off? Can we take the fairing? I'm like, no, because yeah. if they don't know what it is, if exactly. it just looks like yeah. a motor and a frame, uh, it's no longer a bag of racing. If you yeah, take it the bags has off. to have that, that you have to be able to, to just identify from the fairing it, go, yeah. I know what that is. Yeah, you know? absolutely. A lot of times these racing things, they morph into some vehicle that you can't even recognize, you know. It's like you kind of lose a connection with it as much. When I was a little kid, my family was in the drag racing. Mm -hmm. And I remember I couldn't get my mind around top fuel dragsters because I didn't know what it was. You know, funny cars, but pro stocks, I like that. That's a Chevelle, that's a Duster, that's a Dart, that's a Camaro. And I wanted to know which, to me, that determined which one was faster at any red light in America, you know, from (laughs) that race. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. True. So That's talk true. a little bit about, you guys had an event recently where you announced the Bagger Racing League, right? That was at a, a local racetrack here. What, where was that at? Chuck Walla down, uh, I want to say, middle of the desert, for lack yeah. of a better Stop term. There. Yeah. yeah. I mean, great, great facility, though. And, and Mickey, who runs the place, was welcomed us with open arms. And uh, was that in December or January? It was wintertime, I know that. Yeah, and, it was uh, January. It was months, January. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and we, we came out there, we got some of the teams together, and uh, we had a really big experience where we had a number of people show up to watch and an even bigger crowd than we anticipated to ride. Dude, I, I knew random guys that are customers here that went out there and, and rode. I was like, okay, you bought a new Harley like a couple months ago, and now you're out there racing it on the track, huh? That's cool, man. <laughs> More power to you. Yeah, it was, really a, cool it was like you. a track day. It was like yeah. a traditional track day, like kind of run what you brung, but – with the uh, you know with the professional guys like giving some pointers and checking them checking the bikes out and making sure everything was good and even Diego took his live wire, wire out, out there, there. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah. It was, that's pretty cool that's awesome. We were thinking you'd be a little to... skeptical at first, but it came around. Sun came out and dri- yeah. dried the track up, so yeah, yeah. it worked out for the best. Now, did you have your uh, rider riding your bike that day? We did some testing. We were running into some electrical issues, but that's what those track days are for. You know, yeah. you figure some stuff out and trying things and sorting yeah. things out. It's huge getting the testing in, you know, yeah. the first race, my testing was the practices and my heart was racing that whole time, yeah. but we figured it out coming into the last race and, and we did all right. Top five. I'm, I'm pretty happy with that. That's good. So, so this is at Chuck Walla. No, no, I'm talking about the King of the Baggers race, okay. so I was looking but right. my testing was the practices. We got, yeah. Test one time before that, but testing's key. Uh, if I can give anyone pointers, get some testing in before you go race because you're probably going to figure some stuff out. That you yeah, I figure you have probably hundreds of hours into the bike build, right? And then for that not to work out well on race day, like that's got to be a tense moment for oh, you. It's for the sure. highest, the highs, and the lowest, the lows. You're yeah, you're all over the place, but it's racing for you. You know that's what keeps people coming back. That rush you can't really get that anywhere else. No. So. So you finished top five in Laguna Seca, is that what you're saying? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's that's impressive, man. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. I'm, I was beyond stoked for that. You know, I wasn't expecting a top five. We were with some big companies and, you know, the S&S Indian. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, budget of God for that one. Right, and a lot of dollars behind You know, it. Vance and Hines isn't too far behind those guys and stuff. So I'm pretty happy with the turnout. Yeah, that's yeah. good. So. That's awesome. Awesome. So at the going back to the Chuck Walla event, so that was basically you guys made this announcement that you're launching the Bagger Racing League and you're doing a bunch of different classes as well. You know, right. Talk about that for a minute too. And, and who can who can join? Like who can? Who so can anyone like? can join, but what you'd have to do to be able to compete is to go to a race school, which sounds like you're going to be there for a month. You're there for a day. They take you on the track, kind of coach you up, bring you back into a classroom, take you out on the track fix what they needed to fix. And this isn't to make you necessarily go faster. It's to make you do all the safe things that you're supposed to. That's a process of racing. Then they do some, uh, for lack of mock racing at the end of the day. And then there's usually, these are usually on Friday, and then there's usually a race Saturday and Sunday. And you'd race that. And you'd literally be able to compete in one of those three classes, hooligan, big twin, or pro stock bagger, with that certification. Okay. Not how fast you go, just how safe and how you much you know. Because, obviously, you don't start in a line. You start in waves. Yeah. So if you're the fastest, you're in the front. And, unfortunately, if you're the slowest, you're going to start in the back. And yeah. by the time they catch you, it's pretty might have to just pass you rather than a whole pack of you. Sure. So 
Um, but that's how you'd be able to compete in one of those classes. Okay. Is to do the bare minimum, that, that, you know, basically. We can't let you just, I bought yeah. a bike, I'm showing up. You yeah, know, yeah. There's a lot going on. Yeah, there's we, a lot to pay attention to, yeah. And, and we want this. The, the most important thing is for us to be brand new in road racing. The last thing we want to do is try to go against their traditions uh -huh. or change. The, you know, they have a, a formula that works. That works so yeah. Who's they? The road racing world. Okay. You know, the yeah. way they qualify, the way they enter and exit tracks, the way the signals are if there's oil or, if you know, whatever. It, it's universal, and we want to respect the heck out of it. Yeah. We, I want to leave it with more people involved than you know, yeah. than when we started. I'm there's there's sure. protocols and stuff yep. you got to, like, follow and, to, like, to keep everyone safe. It's Exactly. Yeah. Safe, to, you know, we are very, very conscientious that we want everyone to have a great time yeah. and, and showcase what you can do, but, you know, we want everybody to be able to ride home to their families, too. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. That's smart. Well, cool. Um, so what's what's the future plans? Like, I heard there's a Salt Lake coming up pretty soon. Salt Lake's or? coming up. We'll be there in just about a month. Um, that'll be our kickoff event. We're definitely looking at some tracks, and 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 we know that we we started off in an, in a unique year where there are people getting their licenses. There are tracks that are recognizing this. Like I said, just Monday, Northeast Ohio, they had one yeah. you know, the other day, and that was just a group of guys like Dealers, told like yourself, and okay. and they said, hey, our customers Dealers. are seeing this. They want to go to a track. They found an affordable track. They rented it for the day. Did it on a Monday, hmm. and. They had a, a solid turn, enough that they're definitely planning a next round of it. That's cool. That's yeah. very cool. And they just had just anybody that wanted to come out and bring their Harley or? They had to go, it's very similar to Chuck Wall. You had to go through tech, tape up your headlights, mm -hmm. you know, the normal protocol, have leathers, you know, all this stuff. Yeah. But, yeah, just come and ride your bike. It's not a, a race day. You're, you know, you're not going to get a trophy or something. And you get out there and, and battle. So, yeah, they had a great time. I think everybody now, I think you're going to see a big rush on bikes that they could turn into a pure track bike. Sure. I think that's going to be the next thing, you know, yeah. something they can get and go, I don't need to ride. I want to take it to the track and have it be as light and fast and stop as well as it can be. Well, it's crazy. I mean, Keith and I talk about this all the time, but we've seen most of all the custom builds we've done in the past, what, three or four years have all kind of, well, for the most part, been like performance based. We do, we're working on some killer road glide performance yeah. baggers right now. We do a lot of low rider S's like, most all i would say 90 percent of our custom bikes that we do in the soft tail family are based on the lowrider s and so it seems like everybody wants to build that performance bike right now yeah um, they're all kind of if they're not full performance it's performance inspired and like right. kind of race inspired like uh styling you know even if they're not going to track race it it still has that kind of like vibe to it well i mean uh, you know Remember the bodywork bikes when Arlen was building 57 Chevys and guys like Tank out in Ohio were building yeah. the big stretch bodywork. They things weighed 1,200 pounds, and no one cared because it, weight was never the thing. I yeah. remember guys bolting things on top of things that were made out of metal. You know, you're just like, yeah. and that was never the thing. Now, all the carbon fiber, all the titanium, all yeah. the little fasteners, they're trying, you know, the wheels, how much lighter you can put a set of, you yeah. know, how much lighter were those wheels that you had, those 17s? I mean, they just get, I, yeah. you know, the brakes are a huge oh, yeah. part yeah. of this thing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and that's, they, they've transitioned from just, like, a part that's just performance-based only and doesn't matter what it looks like to something that actually works and looks mm -hmm. really good. Like, the carbon fiber stuff is amazing looking. I mean, just the, the aesthetic of it's just, like, and it Gorgeous. works. You know, like... Uh, all the suspension guys too, Legends and Olins. I mean, we got tons of guys that come in. They see these race bikes running Olins because it's very noticeable, gold color, you know. And they they're like, "Hey, I want these shocks." And it's like, "Hey, do you know what those shocks are capable of? Like, this, that's built for a certain thing, you yeah. know." But uh, it's it's all great because it just gets people's imagination going and like ties them into their own bike and what I can, what's possible with my bike and. What, what can I do to do with it? And, you know, it, it does transition over into some projects and stuff like that. Some, the scope of some of them are kind of large, you know, I think people don't realize what's really into one of these bikes until they get into it. But um, it's, it's a lot. There's a lot of little intricacies and small things and details and, you know, stuff that needs to get done to make stuff fit together and work. I mean, you're talking about parts from all kinds of different manufacturers and they don't necessarily research that their part fits with this guy's part and that guy's part and that guy's part. So we're, as assemblers or, you know, technicians, we have to figure that stuff out, you know, so, but. No, absolutely. It's, it's, it's a lot that goes into it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. A lot. You learn along the way. I, we were building my bike for 10 months 
yeah. going into the race, you know, and COVID pushed the original race back. Yeah. And for me, I'm glad that kind of happened because it bought me time to build my bike. <laughs> it seemed like <laughs> it, was, a, it was time that a lot of people needed to refine what they had going on. They yeah, could have put something yeah. on the track in June or July, but it, it wouldn't have been as clean as it was when it yeah, happened. It, it allowed us to really dive in and, and it pushed the bar up for sure, yeah. you know, but there was a lot of time to, to fab stuff up, make these custom one-off parts. And now yeah. we're developing parts that will probably sell, you know, it's good for the aftermarket companies to learn and, and see what we can develop and bring to market and yeah. make it both streetable and trackable. That's how your innovations so, happen. So yeah. you, get, you innovate some new part that's that's going to work for racing, and then everyone sees it and it's cool or it has a street function too. And yeah. then that's, or you know, depending on how universal it is, it can bolt onto a lot of stuff. So that's oh, yeah. good. I think that's what's cool about, you know, guys like you that have, um, they're building the performance parts and you prove them on the track. Yeah. And it's like, hey, you can also buy this part. And this is a point that we were making with Alloy Art as well is, the parts that they're developing right now and using on their bike on the track, it's like, hey, this thing rode, you know, at these big time tracks and we're pulling these types of lap times. These don't just look good. They also perform well to Keith's point. Yeah. Talk, talk a little bit about Alex. Like what are some of maybe the, some of the parts that you feel like you put on your bike that maybe the other guys didn't have that you feel like maybe gave you the edge without giving too um, much away? <laughs> there was, there was a lot of carbon parts that were one off and specific yeah. um, and only a couple people got their hands on them. Um, how, how much did your bike weigh? First of all, Oh man, what did it weigh? It was six thirteen wet, and a, and a, a road glide is about eight thirty stock. Yeah, wet. So we shaved That's some good weight. Saddlemen went crazy. They had like another hundred hundred pounds on me. Um, but I Jeez. think everyone was kind of in that ballpark between like the low fives and the low sixes. So That's crazy. I mean, that's lighter than a stock Sportster. Yeah, I mean, that's crazy. Yeah, you know, I, I push that thing around. I'm like, my Dyna feels heavier. Than yeah. This now, you know, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's crazy, but yeah. everything was carbon. I painted mine so you couldn't really see, but the tank was carbon. You know, that the fairing was completely gutted and cut down to size, and that was all carbon. You know, the fenders, all the bodywork, everything yeah. was just carbon front to back. Um, not to mention the wheels and all the accessories that we cut weight on. I yeah. mean, it was just, it was a process, a lot of... Um, yeah headaches and stressful moments a lot of happy moments you know everything in between but it was fun i wouldn't take it back that's yeah. for sure what are you guys doing right now to prepare for the salt lake race um we're kind of in that same boat you know we, you we got a surprise days? i can't really talk about it yet but uh, <laughs> okay. we got some some cool stuff coming to to utah so. nice now, are you guys able to do track days on the bike and you know get some practicing like how's your rider you know practicing on the bike right now it's good. It's good. Um, he was out a couple weeks back, you know, so we're getting that in. We're, we're still fine tuning some stuff. So we're just getting it ready for BRL, but we learned a lot from the first race and it gave us a head start on, on the BRL and, and moving forward. Yeah. So yeah, we learned a lot. <laughs> yeah. It's a process. Yeah. yeah. It's a process. You start fixing the weak links and the next weak link shows up and the next one and the next one, and the next one and something un unexpected happens. And then you got to, figure that out and maybe hopefully make it better so yeah it's a it's a big big process these bikes are always being refined i think well and you like. don't think about the little things too like you got to buy gallons of race gas and yeah. buy a bunch of spare tires and uh -huh. tire warmers and all this stuff that the normal street guys aren't really yeah. used to and then you enter into this racing world and there's just those little details that safety you, wire and all safety these things, wiring yeah. all of it so yeah, yeah. belly pans belly, belly pans, pans safety yeah. wire catch cans all that stuff yeah yeah, yeah. So um, for those that want to spectate this, um, how, how can they see the one in Salt Lake City? Like, when's it come in, and how do we watch it? All right, so here's what we want you to do. We want you to come to the race. This isn't a lockdown one. The first time we got together, we had my – told you my wife was there. She watched it on television. She couldn't come. It was locked. There was probably, what, 100 people on the grounds that – yeah. Saw the first one. This is the Laguna Seca one. Come to this one. race, people. Come and camp yeah. and party and be part of the action. Yeah. Uh, we've talked to guys like Brian Clock. Um, at the BRL party, there was people talking about having rides here, and they're going to ride from here to Mesquite or here to Vegas, party, and then ride into Salt Lake the next day and be there for the whole weekend. So please, you get on baggerracingleague.com. There's information. You can follow us on uh, Bagger Racing League on Instagram and, and on Facebook. So do that, but please come to the race and uh, bring all your friends. We want If we could get the people to 
come and watch it, we know that the, the future is going to just be brighter and brighter, and we know that it'll grow. Now, for the people around the world, we've, we're fortunate enough to partner up with Fight, F-I-T-E, uh-huh. and it'll be streamed live. Then we'll have the folks from Lucas Oil, Mav TV, which do motocross yeah. and things like that, and then there'll be a program that comes out leading up to and after and a bunch of stuff. But if you want to watch it live, it'll be on Fight, Fight. which is an app. Um, you can get it on your Roku, Roku and yeah. all, DirecTV, all that stuff. Yeah. So um, tons of coverage. We're going to do our best to bring you the Hooligan, the Big Twins, the Bagger GP. The Yeah, talk more about the classes, Rob. Yeah. All right, so, so Hooligan yeah. would be your basic sportster, um, Indian Scout. I think most of the people have kind of seen those bikes race more than probably anything in the last couple of years. Yeah. Uh, the big twin class, which has never happened. You have your Dyna, your FXR, your your new M8. I think there's some twin cam and Evo soft tail models, but I can't <laughs> think of any one of those that would be real good for this. Yeah. But you know, um, and then the new Indian Chief. Then we have the class for the the pro stock baggers, which are going to be the riders probably won't be up to the specs of a Ben Bostrom, and then yeah. obviously the premier class. And the one thing that we're uh, we're finalizing all the details. We want to have a stunt show with an invited stunt. Those sea bears and and <laughs> Logan lackeys of the world. They're going to stunt. That'll get a score. Uh-huh. So some of you will well, be first cool. and some of you will be second. Then on Saturday, they'll qualify. Then on Sunday, they'll race. So they'll have a stunt score and a race score. And we'll find who oh, the wow. fastest stunner in the world right. is. Cool. That's cool. So That's somebody cool. could lay claim to, you know, the greatest all-around stunner for till the next one, you know. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. That's I didn't rad. hear about that. That's neat. Yeah, I'd like to see that. So yeah, you're coming, sure. you're saying. Great. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I might have to download that. You're at least app. sending <laughs> you're at least sending the whole staff to to get on board, yeah, right? Hey, uh, and a lot of our guys, yeah, I support it. A lot of our guys in the shop anyways, Jamie's one. He's a big Moto America. He's been watching racing his whole life and raced and everything and he's excited about it and they're all they were all talking about making the trip so yeah we're uh and that'd be great we're, it's in the works but yeah we did a trip to utah last year with matt and it was a lot of fun so yeah that's a good ride and oh from it's here it's beautiful ride. yeah so I, I think we'd be stupid not to do something like that so we'll check it out but yeah we're uh we're, we got a lot of guys around here that are excited about it i know and i went down to the event on sunday and it was pretty neat to see everyone kind of just talking and and you know t- collaborating on stuff and kicking you know, ideas those, around yeah one of those we got together and uh, we were real lucky. Robbie, David Eckert, again, Alex had a big part of it. Uh, Chris Eckert had a big part of it. We said, "Listen, let's we're going to be in town. Yeah, let's get together. And if anybody needs anything or questions, so we were all get together and like yeah. you saw, it was a big bench race, brainstorm, feel good session. Yeah. We got a lot of great social content out there. We launched the fight. Uh, you know where we're going to be with that. We've got a lot of social content coming out." Um, Guys from uh, from all over. We had people flying in from all over, so it was really something. We were very yeah. happy with the with the results. It turned out good. Yeah. Good. So so where where and when is the Salt Lake race? I don't think we touched on that yet. It's Utah Motorsports Campus, if you're familiar, okay. it was called Miller Motorsports for forever and ever and ever. It's Tool T O O L E Tooley, uh, Utah area, probably about a half an hour outside of the city. Okay. Um, on the BaggerRacingLeague.com, there's hotel packages, camping packages, places where you could come. You come anything from a pop-up tent to a diesel pusher, you know, or stay in the hotels or whatever. And there's obviously campgrounds around the facility. Um, it's the weekend of June 25th. Yeah, 25, 26, 27. So 25 would be the Friday, probably a later afternoon, then all day Saturday and all day Sunday. And right. Sunday would be the races. Nice. Um, we plan on having the vendors there, uh, getting them in early. We want to get everybody teched early, so Saturday morning – you know, as soon as the track goes hot, you'll be out there warming up. And, oh, yeah. yeah. So you said that there's a premier class. Now, in the premier class, are we going to see racers similar to those that we saw, like, at Moto, like the Lugia Yes, Seiko Bagger, race? Bagger GP. Yes, absolutely. But those are the guys that are a little bit better. They help the professional racers in, yes. in the premier class. And yep. the, the class right, right below that, you said, is pro stock class? Um, yeah, pro stock bagger. So mm-hmm. it would just be, again, there were so many people that um, when we started talking about this even, wanted to do it yeah you know, how many shredders do you guys have coming here man? I shred the canyon I can, yeah. you know and they wanted to do it i said well listen guys like a ben bostrom or something with the decades of he's yeah. a world champion and world i mean you know yeah he 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 loves everybody but he doesn't want to race a guy that's never done this before right. to For the sure. level you know i mean it'd be like any professional athlete doesn't you know want to play with a 
somebody right. that's just getting started, basically. Yeah, right. But, and usually the speed, the technique, the race craft, everything is so different. Refined. So they're by themselves, and then the other group is has the opportunity, you know. Yeah. So as we're talking about before the sh- before we start recording, like the barrier to entry is lower now. So it's like you can if you have a bike and you go to a class, you can enter and race people in the similar in bikes. Three or, classes. Yeah. In, in a sportster, exactly. a big twin, or a bagger. So basically every bike that Harley makes, if you do the class and thing and there's still some classes that have that can be done. So you can still get in. It's gonna be you'd have about two weeks before the race to get it yeah. completed, but there are so some. But uh yeah. You know, get it done and, and come out and do it. Get leathered up, get your bike ready, and I think you'd have the time of your life. It's addicting, isn't it? Super. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so the barriers, yeah. the barriers of entry are a lot lower than your typical, you know, racing yeah, atmosphere. Yeah, I mean, what, what we first saw in the, like, King of the Baggers race was these are, like, full-built motorcycles. I mean, that, that's a huge commitment. You're committing a vehicle, a bunch of money and time and effort and travel expenses. parts and travel expenses. And like Alex was saying, you know, those things you don't even think about, you need gallons of fuel, you need all these other things to support that vehicle. You don't need all that stuff in some of these other classes. You can show up and you have your license and your leathers and your bike and it, Pop it out of the back yeah, of a pickup truck and go. go. <laughs> you know, it's like back in the old school, like, uh, drag racing days when NHRA first started. Guys would roll up in U-Hauls with their dragster in the back and unload the thing and go to the track and race professional teams and stuff, you know. And it was like, it was fun back exciting. then, you know. Yeah. yeah, it definitely adds a different element of excitement to it. When, yeah. And it's you, cool. you got these, you know, privateer guys coming out there and doing their thing. You gotta so, love the yeah. privateers because they're crafty. I mean, they, they, <laughs> they those figures. guys know how, and girls know how to get it done. Because I, I think we're gonna have more and more girls racing yeah. as time goes on. Yeah, oh, yeah. I know the guys and girls at, at Moto or at uh, Royal Enfield are putting together a flat track program and a road race program, uh-huh. and just uh, it, there's so many. Uh, girls that are riding bikes now, they want to race too. So yeah. come on, come on, ladies, let's go. I yeah. know Patricia Fernandez would welcome you. Yeah, for sure. There's a lot of ladies in racing now, you mm-hmm. know, drag racing and NASCAR. And now winning. Too, and yeah. Doing great. Yeah, they're doing, they do good. They do well. That's awesome. And, and they, I feel like they get a lot of attention too. Like, um, I mean, it's cool to see, uh, you know, a woman out there riding with the guys when, you know, historically it's been like kind of taboo and to see someone come in have the guts to do it and do it and be successful at it. Like that's, that's a cool thing to see. So absolutely. what's uh so what's your goals moving forward with the bagger racing league? Like what, what's after salt Lake and what, what are your goals? You guys just hoping just to get as many eyeballs as possible at this point and grow the sport or what I, you know, if, if, if it was going to be simple to just label it, we want people to come watch it, experience it. And then hopefully, you know, and we know that it's, it's, it's not for everyone, the racing part of it. I think the enjoyment, the party part of it is for everybody. Yeah. But we know that once you do it, then the next step would be a track day. You know, do you like that? Well, maybe you want to take it to the next level and do some club racing. Mm-hmm. And then maybe you go, you know what? I want to dedicate a bike to kind of doing this stuff. It's worth it. It's, you know, highly entered. You, you know, when you're done, you're tingling. Yeah. Like when you're done a lot of pushing yourself to a limit, you get off the bike. And yeah. I don't think there's anything in the world that can get you into that euphoric state other than taking your mind and putting it on the edge. You're doing it. Yeah. yeah. You That's do a it. lot of adrenaline. Yeah. Oh yeah. And, and once that happens, I'd, I'd just love to grow each class of rider, you know, to get to the point I heard that back in the 883 days, which would have been the early 90s, it was very common for them to have 55 entrants in that class. Uh-huh. I mean, that would be that would be fantastic to, yeah. s- to see that come down the straightaway 55 sporties or big twins or bag. Yeah. I mean, any of those would be, that'd be amazing <laughs> to see. That's a lot see, of bikes, so. yeah. That's a lot of bikes. Yeah, That's cool, though. A, a culture that we talk a lot about at our dealership is the, the club-style dyno world. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, that look and style and... Uh, that culture is really popular on the on the West Coast, especially in Southern California here. And so, um, I, I'm really curious to see how many of those guys that you know uh, that rip it on the road are going to come out and, and try their their hand at an actual race. You know, and, and you know entering the you call it the big twin class. Yeah. Um, and, and I say Dyna, but now the modern day soft tails are obviously be bunched in there as well. It's funny. I mean, I'm an FXR enthusiast. I've owned I don't know, ten or twelve of them in my life. And I thought there's no better bike that Harley's ever going to make than yeah. the FXR. The new soft hill, I'll tell yeah, you this, folks, yeah. is better than my FXR. Yeah. 
So, I mean, that's... You heard well, it, guys. You heard yeah. it from the man no, right here. Because we I'm, still have argument. I never you heard wanted it from nothing ever to be better than my FXR. <laughs> that new soft tail, that's a heck of a machine. Well, like, it really like, is. Like Rob said earlier, too, like, if you really want to test yourself, like, it's it's cool to go run in the canyons and stuff like that, but there's there, there's potholes and there's other vehicles and there's things going the on that you can The last thing you want to do is whack into a family exactly. car with some... Right. I mean, this is... There's nothing in your way. If yeah. you go down, the medical crew will be there yeah. in a second. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And and there's a run. You're not running into a guardrail. You're running into a sand pit, a then some gravel, mm-hmm. then you run off, and then an air fence. Yeah. I mean, if you're going to do it, this is how you do it. Trust me. That's how you do it safely and fa- I mean, you can get a, you can get your vehicle like to speeds you couldn't couldn't imagine on a regular road on a track surface. Like, yep. and if it's done right and safely, it's uh, you want to test your bike and your skills. That's the place to go do it. Absolutely. Yeah, get it off the street. Go over there to the track and get it done. And, like, if you really think you're, like, can ride, then get out there and let us see it, man. But, yeah. yeah, that's that's the way to do it. It's it's a, it's it's cool It's cool to watch. I don't personally do it. But, man, those guys come off the track, and I'm like, dude, that looks like a lot of fun. Yeah. That looks like a lot of fun. I'll be uh, spectating. I'm not going to be participating. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, yeah, I definitely want to check might it out. Con, we might be able to coax Jamie into doing it. That would be <laughs> rad. Yeah, a laid law sponsored rider or something. Yeah. <laughs> We'd welcome you guys with open arms. Yeah. I could tell you that. Yeah. So what's your plans, Alex? What you got going on at the Sly Fox Company coming up? Uh, you know, the race coming up at the end of June, that's taking a lot of focus right now. But um, just trying to create new product, you know, yeah. on the back end, working with working with making new parts and bringing cool stuff to market and getting it out there. We're, right now we're going through, like, a back order crisis, which uh, is good. Yeah, everyone so, is, yeah. Um, just keeping up with that demand and still being innovative same time yeah so are you guys doing any parts for like the soft tail platform right now or are you pretty much focused on baggers the baggers right now we have handlebar risers that will work on the soft tail platform um but baggers is the focus right now we're, we're doing the performance scene um when we find some time we'll, we'll probably move to the soft tail i think that's where the trend's moving is yeah is soft tails next yeah um, but there's some solid years left in this performance bagger trend you know oh, yeah. especially yeah. with the racing emerging from it now you know yeah. that, that took it was already there, the performance scene or the performance bagger scene. Now it's just, it's a whole different animal. Skyrocketed. So, yeah. It's yeah. When we talk on this topic, we talk a little bit about, okay, well, how long is this going to last? And, um, you know, sometimes we throw out the word trend, um, but I don't think it's going anywhere anytime soon. You know, we had um, um, Hot Bike Magazine. Jeff, um, Holt. Jeff, Jeff Holt. Holt. Jeff Holt. Thank you. We had him on the podcast, and he said, you know, if there's one thing that never goes out of style, it's performance. And I totally agree with him. Yeah. You know, so I, I think it's going to be around for a while. But another thing that kind of intrigues me, too, is, uh, and we talked a little bit about this with Jeff Holt as well, is the the different cycles of, of ways that customers and, and people modify their baggers. You know, in the early 2000s, we saw, in the mid-2000s, we saw the big wheel baggers, as he would talk about it. Uh, with the big wheels, the big speakers, and the big fairings, and the long stretch saddlebags and stuff. And now I feel like nobody does that anymore in Southern California. Maybe sometime a little bit on Florida still. but Well, you know, you, you mentioned that. And, and what was funny during most of the trends up until this one, um, I guess you'd have to almost go back to probably, as crazy as this sound, like World War II, those guys came home and made bobbers. Yeah, mm-hmm. you know, that's what they made out of them. They weren't pretty. They weren't not. They were effective. They were lightweight, and they were trying to make them fast. Yeah, mm-hmm. and then those morphed into like basically choppers through the '60s and whatnot. Then we get up into the to the soft tail era with stretch tanks and the big teardrop stretch air cleaner covers and everything down on the ground. So the painter made a lot of money. Yep. <laughs> the chromer made a lot of money. And yep. back in those days, obviously the bolt on companies, the billet stuff was big. Yeah. But when it went to to the, the big wheel baggers, the guy that made the wheel who raked the frame, who painted it in the stereo shop, that's it. There wasn't nothing really so much bold on as it was. You had to fab everything. Yeah. This is a big motor, a really good set of brakes. The frame has to be stock. So now it's the triple trees, the swing arm. the It's, it's a bolt-together project, basically. Yeah. So mm-hmm. <clears throat> dealerships, can somebody could bring you all the stuff, and like you said, you can meld it together and make one yeah. of these. Where before, you're like, I'm not cutting the neck off your frame, yeah. raking it out to this far, yeah. welding it back together. You're on your own. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, really. these are something you guys can build. Yeah. And as soon as somebody figures out the cam bus on how to get rid of all that, the electrical is not going to be the mm-hmm. problem. Yeah, yeah. I know a couple guys are working on it now, so it'll sure. be cool. Yeah, it's like it's like anything. Like We talked to with Jeff and, and Robbie about that, like, 
racing's as old and performance is as old as time. I mean, you put put a group of guys in two shopping carts and they're going to figure out how to race them, man. It's like it's <laughs> like that's just what people do. Like it's nah, a natural. Sure. It's in every. It's in all of us. So. Yeah, it's a cool thing to see it, like, kind of coming into And the performance bagger market's kind of been emerging. It's been coming for a long time, but it's really seen it's, like, like getting really big right now. It's getting huge, and with racing, just making it more legitimate and more, you know, in front of everyone is going to be a big thing for the whole industry, I think. It's going to be a big, big deal. So I think even drag, if you talk to those guys like Ted, like, their racing parts are killing it over, over all the, like, aesthetic stuff now. Well, you, you yeah. think about a guy like... You mentioned Ted from Drag Specialties. <clears throat> he sells remote reservoir shocks, yep. swing arms, carbon fiber, cool seats. Now, instead of, remember before, I think if you want any form, we're not going to change my wires from 10 to 12 to mm -hmm. 14 to 16. Well, now you got to change them again because you're literally going under, mm -hmm. and you don't want that big hoop, so now yep. you're buying under wires. So, yep. But, I mean, the seats are tall, the bars are low, the pegs are back, yep. the pipe is up, you yep. know, all that stuff. The shocks are long. Yep. So it's, you know, all of that that's that needs to be incorporated into your program. For sure. Yeah, for sure. Very cool. All right, guys. Well, we like to keep our podcast about an hour. Um, we really appreciate you guys coming out. For those of you watching, make sure you check out the Bagger Racing League. Follow them on all their social media platforms. I know you guys do Instagram. You have your website. Do you have any Facebook. others? Facebook, Facebook is sure. a big one for you guys. Check them out in Salt Lake City on, you said, June 26th, the weekend of June 26th. 25, 26, 27. And Fight TV is going to be our live partner to bring it all to you. So, and not just one class. They're going to, you're going to see the whole thing. Oh, so, you know, better and watch your buddies. We, and the best way to check that out is on your smart device and your smart TV, whether it be Roco, Apple TV, or whatever you download. That, yep. Fight. Fight app. Yep. You F I T E. F I T E app. And that's going to have, you guys are going to have all your stuff up there, right? Yep. Awesome. Actually, Very the cool. marketing on it starts tomorrow. So we have a call and they're going to launch right away. They, were, they nice. were on site at the – did you come into the TV room? No, no, no. Okay. I was out bench racing with Nick Trask and <laughs> all them guys outside <laughs> talking about bikes and checking stuff out, yeah. So. Right on. Well, thanks a lot, guys. Appreciate it, Rob. Thanks, we, Alex. Thanks we can't thank us. you enough. Yeah, yeah, best of luck to you, and we'll be watching you for sure. For sure. Awesome. Folks, right. get out to the races. Come see us, please. We want to we wanna share it with you. Yeah, right if on. you haven't checked it out, go check it out. It's some, it's some craziness. It's, it's fun. It's, it's a good time. If you guys haven't already, make sure you subscribe to the channel. Follow us on our podcast as well. Like I said, this is kicking off our first episode in Season 2. We'll be having more in the future. All right, thanks for watching, guys. Later. See ya. Corey West on the Sly Fox Road Glide. Travis Wyman, folks, on a turbocharged Road Glide from Trask. And the battle starts to heat up over the course of the time the aftermarket industry joined forces here if you will they come together they're kept in everybody going all day long and they develop these bikes for this one off event first inaugural never before done drag specialties king of the baggers and are out on the track right now getting warmed up